Speaking of technology, the DDPY app, flawless, never has a tech problem. Am I right? <laughs> I wouldn't go never. <laughs> never. And never. And you've been doing a lot of live workouts as of late besides the app, stuff over Instagram. Do you have any of those coming up? Um, no, I'm just going to sit now just on the app. I wanted to go on to uh, Facebook for a while there. And just to let people see what we've got going on, I'll probably do something in another couple of weeks. Depends. You know, it looked like, you know, we started opening up the country again and people were getting. To work. A lot of people were. I know my guys are. We're not doing the workouts, but a lot of the guys are all back at work. And then I, the, the, you see what happened to the, uh, um, the stock market yesterday dropped 1,800 points because coronavirus went boom, boom, boom. So, you know, if, if, that, if, the, if the second wave shuts us down, then I'll do more stuff on uh, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, the stock market was bad unless you did foreign exchanges like I did, bought and sold Nintendo, jackpot. Anyway, we're going to be taking <laughs> questions from people as they're chatting in right here. I see Joey's asking, when did you start the DDP yoga thing? We'll get to that one in a little bit. But if you've got a question for Dallas, ask it. If not, I'm going to ask him all the questions. I don't think you guys want that. So who's got the first great question here? If you don't got it, then I'm going to have to ask Dallas. Dallas, later today, I'm going to be interviewing Tommy Lee for Motley Crue. Is that someone you've met before? Yeah, I actually have a really fun picture from uh, me and Tommy Lee in, um, God, I bet you it was 1987. You know, so we're going back, God, uh, 33 years. And uh, I had a Motley Crue jacket that a friend of mine had painted for me. And uh, I wore it, a uh, little jean jacket that had one of their logos from one of their albums. Um, what was really interesting that day, um, Heather Locklear, who was, was dating Vince at the time, uh, he, the manager of Motley Crue, uh, I, I, I can't remember, I think his last name was Fisher at the time, and uh, his girlfriend lived in Fort Myers and came to my nightclub all the time. And so, you know, she's like, oh, I'll get you backstage. Everybody was so nice from Tommy Lee, the Vince, uh, you know, the whole band. They got pictures from a bunch of them. And, uh, you know, the first band was out there playing. So who's open up for him? I walked out there and I was like, oh, these guys are awesome. I never heard of them before. It was Guns N' Roses. <laughs> right, before, right before the Appetite for Destruction, you know, had started to go out, you know. I can't remember if it was 86 or 87. Whatever it was, it was, uh, it was a, lot of, a lot of great music back then. Well, the questions are starting to flow in. I just saw one that asked about your confrontation with MJF. Any comments on that one? God, I had fun with it, man. I think, uh, you know, I think MJF is one of the – I think he's one of the hottest young rising stars in professional wrestling. And, uh, you know, his work in the ring is good. It's real, For 23, it's real good. Uh, but his mic skills and knowing what to say and <laughs> – and uh, kind of probably not knowing what not to say and still saying it uh, is his biggest, uh, um, you know, his biggest asset, I think. And, uh, you know, I loved being out there with him, and it was, it was fun. I just saw someone wrote something, I think it was in Sports Keter, that, uh, that said um, something about the, the angles and storylines that AEW are doing that they were really different and they were talking about the one that we shot where we got our, our six man match and they, they put it in and one of the guys was 51 and the other guy was 63 and still got that, you know, that whole, you know, angle over and help build max to get more ready for Cody uh, for that match. Uh, so it was a, uh, it was a lot of fun, man. I loved working with them. I love bantering back and forth with him. It was fun. Somebody asked along the way, who do you think is the best wrestler today? That is a tough question. But some of your favorites these days? Well, two, two of my uh, favorite guys, uh, one's going to be Cody Rhodes, you know, who I think is really at an all-time high on his game. 
as far as you know just the his interviews are flawless you know they're completely different than his old man or flair but for this generation they rival those those interviews every interview he does is powerful um working the rings great he's taking these young guys you talk about a guy's going out there and, and taking young talent like darby allen would be the first guy i think about and uh you know no one even knew who darby allen was unless you're a hardcore um independent guy but in one match cody beat him but he made him and all you got to do is look where Darby is today. Let's see, that was October. So November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. So in eight months, the kid's gone from obscurity to, you know, being a, a bona fide name in the company. Now, do I ever think he would have got that opportunity in, in WWE? Not a chance. Now, not like that. Um, and he's seen as a guy who can go with anybody. And, Darby's got an incredible work ethic. Uh, is you know he's one of those straight edge guys. He doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't do drugs. He looks wild, you know, but you know he's not. He's is as serious as he is with his um, craziness that he will push his body to. He is just as serious about rehab. Like you will see workouts come out with you know my DDP yoga. Uh, with Darby Allen in the actual workouts that'll go up on the app because he's whenever he's home he makes it a point to get over here for you know a couple of days uh, he's real he's, he's, he's another amazing young talent along with MJF AW and then my man I, and you know I called this five years ago when Drew McIntyre um, was going back to the WWE and people said to me, who, who's your guy who's going to – who do you think is going to be the biggest star in the business? I said, Drew McIntyre. And it took years for them to actually let Drew be himself. And as soon as they gave him just the slightest push and let him be himself, because Drew McIntyre is exactly what you see. And the guys who really get over in this business are guys – who are exaggerated versions of themselves. And um, I'm so proud of that kid, man. You know, I'm, so, I'm super proud of him. I'm glad, you know, for his opportunity. We, have, we've, we, we talk all the time. And uh, right before Mania, you know, uh, you know, you knew that there wasn't going to be a crowd for WrestleMania. And they're the biggest crowds ever. Just, um you know, shot at the main event at WrestleMania is not going to be in front of any people. And he was a little bit, just a little bit down about it. And I was like, Drew, I said, tell me who won WrestleMania 33 or 27 or 15. Yeah. Can you tell me who won? No. But I during a time, I would say there's better than and there's less than. If you're not the best, you are less than unless you're different then. And Eric Bischoff taught me that. And I, I've been living it my whole life, never really knowing I was doing that. And I said, Drew, you and your match with Brock will be remembered more than anything because of the COVID. So embrace that because you're doing something that no one's ever had to do before. And you're going to do it at a high level. And I know you are. So I want you to embrace that. And then a couple of weeks it went by, and then we were talking. And Ben, he goes, you know, we were talking. He said, yeah, a lot of everybody keeps going to me. Man, I can't believe you're not going to have any people at WrestleMania, you know, to cheer for you in this match. And he goes, everybody's really down about it. Everybody but DDP, you know, <laughs> like, because again, you, you got to always look at when you don't have any control over anything, you got to right. look at, like, what's happening and what can I control? And what I can control is to go out there and have the best match I can. I can control my attitude and, you know, my mindset, the story I tell myself. And Drew's, and I'm super proud of him. From Every time he gets in front of a camera and he starts talking, he gets better and better and better. 
how is he going to be when he gets there and the people are back? Because they'll still be pushing him because there's no discerning factor that tells him he's not getting over. When he is finally in front of people and they were losing their shit back when he was right at the end, when he was getting that push, the people were with him. When he comes back, he, he's going to be insanely over. Insanely. And speaking of people who are a little more modest, I saw a question asked how Arthur Borman is doing. And Arthur, for those who don't know, one of the first successes of DDPY Yoga, if not the first viral video. So how's he doing? Uh, well, right now he's got to go through knee surgery because his, you know, got to remember, Arthur couldn't walk without knee braces, back braces, and canes for 15 years, you know, and the knees were bad to begin with. His whole, his whole deal back in the day was to get his knees operated on, lose 50 pounds so he could get his knees operated on. He never had his knees operated on because of the program, eating correctly. He's gotten another 13 years, you know, out of that. And so uh, I'm pretty sure he's going to go in there for a total knee replacement soon. But he's still working out. He's still doing because it's always best when you're about to go in for surgery that you keep working out so you strengthen your body so you can go through the surgery. You know, out there's mm -hmm. listening and, uh, you know, and you end up where you have to get a surgery. You don't want to not do anything before it. You can, so the surgery is... Well, I just see uh, somebody just said DDP works, uh, DDPY works rather. You work as well, but DDPY works. I think we all know that if we've tried that to say the least. But I, I've seen a question or two. Someone was talking about the Chris Jericho cruise, which you've been part of two of those. Yeah. And they talked about the story told on board about how the toothpick got Hall, you were involved in that development. Are there other gimmicks that you might have played a hand in developing or getting out there? Oh, God, there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, I just don't, you know, off the top of my head, remember. Raven was well, Raven was one of my favorite. Um, Scotty was still that A-boy, you know, guy coming out of New York uh, back when he, you know, was doing the manager thing because they didn't even really let him wrestle. And Scotty, you know, was one of the most talented wrestlers ever. And I remember... Uh, coming back from that tour in 94, I think it was. Could have been 95, but I'm pretty sure it was 94. And, yeah, it was 94. Um, we, Hogan had had a tour over in the U.K. And, you know, when you're over in the U.K. and then you go into Europe and Germany and, you know, there's not a lot of English-speaking channels. But the one that was was MTV. And I've been watching MTV since it started in 85, and I used a lot of great ideas off of MTV for my nightclub back in the day. And um, as I'm watching, because I hadn't really paid attention to MTV in a while, I realized, wow, the only bands I even know were Bruce Springsteen and Aerosmith that were up for awards. But the all the Green Day and Nirvana and all those bands – they were like the center of what was happening in the 90s. So I, after I came back, one of my best friends picked me up at the airport, and Kimberly and I were still together you know, back then, and so we did a lot of traveling together. And when I came, when, I, when Tony picked me up, he's a very big guy in the music scene, um, I was talking about how I can't, you know, I didn't realize that rock and roll is kind of being phased out for this whole new set of rock and roll, you know, alternative music. And uh, and Tony said to me, is there anybody in wrestling that represents that group of kids? And I said, you know, no, there's not. You know, and, um, and I said, God, I wonder who could do that. And Kimberly in the back goes, Scotty could. And I go, Levy? I go, yeah, I'll bet you he could. So I called him up, and I, and I told him. I, I, first, I called Paul Heyman, who was running uh, ECW at the time. 
And I said, Paul, I've got this idea for Scotty Levy. And um, I, I, I want to try it out with you first. Like, ACW was really new at the time. Remember, Raven's not right. there yet. And uh, I said, I want to try it out with you. But at some point, I'm going to want him to come to WCW. Because I, me and Bischoff were so tight, and I helped so many guys get jobs. I was helping with a lot of the booking and creating of talent um, coming up. Um, like the whole thing that uh, the um, the thing, it was Bischoff's idea, but the whole Mortal Kombat idea. You know, Ray Lloyd putting Ray in that spot. Ray was a black belt in karate, and he really, like, he wasn't faking katas. You know, he could do all that stuff. He could do all the stuff with the weapons. And I put Canyon in that spot, Brian in another spot, and uh, Bischoff brought in uh, um, Ernest Miller. And that was one of my projects. But so was Levy. So was Disco Inferno. So all these mid-card guys, let's see what we can do with them, you know? Um, but Levy was the, you know, Scotty the Body was, was my favorite because I'd known Scotty since I broke into the business as a manager. And I liked him, and I thought he was really smart. And he really understood the business on a different, like a Jake Roberts storytelling level. And... Um, so I said, okay, Scotty, here's the idea. I give him the idea. I said, create a character around this personality. So he calls me up uh, about a week later. He said, okay, what do you think about Raven? I go, Raven? He goes, yeah, nevermore, bro. Nevermore. I go, cut me a promo. And he starts with this dark promo. And then he goes, yeah, boy. And he flips into the other. I go, you were on a roll, but that sucked. Click. You know? <laughs> and he would call me, like, probably every couple of days to give me another promo of the character. And it probably took him about two or three weeks. And then I was like, wow, dude, you got it. You got it. Let me call Paul. So I called Heyman up. And, uh, and he, he went there. And him and made amazing music together they would really create the brawling in the stands you know right well uh, i see a question pop up from a few people here they, they've asked if you've ever been to india before never been to india uh, one of my best friends is adi shankar who uh who's from india and he is probably he might be one of the, he's in the, within the top 10 really movers and shakers in Hollywood. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw that show, Castlevania. Uh, it's yeah. on Netflix. Well, he created that. He did, he's done so many things. If you look him up on IMDb, you'll be some blown away. But we did a show together uh, called, it should be out this year. It's a Netflix original. And mm -hmm. um, I've, Right now, the working title is Gods and Secrets. It's a very dark superhero, um, very dark superhero uh, um, series. And uh, I'm super excited about it because Adi is doing some, you know, miracles with what we did, creating all of the, 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 the music that goes with it and the special effects. Uh, it's real. It's like a it's like a graphic novel come to life that also plays into like when the fights start it's like watching street fighter in um you know back in the 80s because this whole set it's all set in 1987 in an alternate universe and so the uh the actual fight scenes are done like you're playing a video game with you know energy bars above them or different things like the, the live characters become video games and uh, it's got a really powerful message. So, uh, Adi, when I think about it, that's as close as I've been to India, is working with the great Adi Shankar. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll get there one day. Uh, that's one of your many credits. What was your first acting gig, by the way? Because for a while, you appeared in a lot of movies. Uh, I remember you had quite a role in the early 2000s when you were living in L.A. 
Yeah, I did a bunch of stuff, uh, but I, I constantly, I realized I was never going to get that opportunity, you know, like the guys are getting today. The Rock has really broken ground on a different level. You know, all you got to do is look at Batista, Cena, um, Edge. I mean, so many guys have gotten opportunities because The Rock has redefined, redefined what we can do. I mean, he's the biggest star in the world. So pretty sweet, man. Uh uh, and happy to be a part of that whole scene. Um, but my first movie I ever did, I was filming, I was actually working with WCW and, you know, we were TBS and TNT and TBS had a, uh, a movie called first daughter where we kidnapped the president's daughter. And I, I flew to Sydney, Australia, and I, uh, was one of the, uh, entourage of bad guys um, along with Dominic Purcell, who was the second lead on that show, Prison. You know, with, uh, back in the day, um, um, that was on, I can't remember which station it was on. It was a big show, though. Um, and it was, this, at that time, the highest rated movie to come out of TBS, you know, and forever. So uh, it's still got, and he's still playing all the time. You know, it's pretty funny because I see myself, I'm about 255 then, as opposed to 220. <laughs> and just, uh, you know, just took up all the space on the camera. Was that a uh, first daughter? Was that the one with Sinbad? No, Sinbad wasn't it, no. Katie Holmes was in this movie? I, I, I think I can place this one. No, this is uh, Muriel Hemingway. It was, it okay. was yeah. It was, uh, she was like, she was like the, uh, the, uh, secret service chair. It was done. Okay. It was done well. They did really, they did really well with it. And it was for my first movie in 98 and to have such a high rating, you know, a lot of it had to do with wrestling because people who watched the wrestling watched over onto that, you know? I just saw a random question that caught my eye. Thoughts on the one warrior nation. You were around for that one. Mm, I don't even remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, someone also asked about your thoughts on Cody and the Nightmare Family. Kind of a blanket question right there. I, I think that Cody is, uh, he, he's, he's booking, you know, because he's the writer there. He's booking himself a lot like his dad would have and booked himself. I mean, he, the, you know, for a kid who was never really taught how to write TV and in storylines, he just had that second instinct about it, you know, and I think he's doing amazing with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some things they're learning and, you know, you'll see it and then it's gone. But as a whole, you know, it, that whole, um, you know, we're for everyone type of mentality is, uh, you know, there's something for everyone <laughs> in, on AEW. And uh, it's, um, I don't know, it's a great place for, you know, for, for, kids to come up in a in a company that they get to grow with which is pretty exciting you've already mentioned mjf he's on the ddpy train darby allen anybody that we'd be surprised to learn about for example butcher and the blade are they random ddpy guys no they're no they're not they have it i'm, I'm sure they do it occasionally I do. um but no one like uh you know no one i can really think of you would go oh my god they do it <laughs> Right. Uh, Marco Stunt, any idea if he is a guy? No, but uh, Jungle Boy, you know, he, he, he does the program. And uh, he sent me pictures of him not being able to touch his toes and put his hands on the floor. And when you're a guy like, you know, I like Jungle Boy Jack because Jack's his real first name and uh, Jack's a cool name. And uh, he, that kid's got a lot of talent, man, a lot, lot, lot of talent. Uh, but when you think about it, I mean, he's only like 22 or something like that, 22 or 23. Uh, he's been abusing his body to you know, just do the stuff that he's done. You know, someone him like him needs the workout, you know, because, you know, if you, if you want to get a good run, you know, and not be walking around in pain all the time. And that's one of the things a lot of these people who are fans, a lot of the real fans, they appreciate it because they know, wow, these guys are beating themselves to death and a lot of people look at it and go oh it's all fake like nothing nothing in the business has ever been realer than what these kids especially nxt and AEW, you know and then any big pay-per-view 
for the guys on the main roster. Uh, they take it to a different level, man. And I don't know how the young bucks do it. I don't know how they can walk around. I, you know, Ric Flair said something very early on, and I never forgot it. He said, it's amazing what the body can get used to. The problem lies when you stop and you take off a few months and then come back. That's where you, that's where you really feel it. <laughs> well, I just see uh, the Brittany Page just said, "Oh hi, Dad." So uh, mm -hmm. hi to Brittany, of course. I was up there taking care of little Oakley, the little the little diamond granddaughter. <laughs> I'm in great daughter. Uh, I saw a couple of people asking about Big Cass. That's somebody who you know and you've gotten on board with and taken care of. Is Cass doing well these days? I haven't talked to him in a long time. I know he, I know he went to rehab. I know he's working on his stuff. Uh, and um, I wish him all luck. You know, I, I was happy to hear that he'd gone to rehab for you know for a couple of months. So hoping that uh, when he comes out of that, or it, if he might even be out right now. You know, he makes better decisions, you know. Somebody asked, I think it was Ron who's in a lot of these chats, what's your favorite WWE match? <laughs> Austin and Bret Hart. <laughs> you know, for me personally, it was WrestleMania with, uh, with uh, Christian because he actually laid it all out there with me. And it was a lot of fun just being, you know, with Christian and getting to work with him. And when I almost broke my neck with Bob Holly, I knew it was time to go, okay, I'm done. <laughs> you know, I, I loved what I did, but really I did everything that I needed to do in WCW. And thank God that Vince bought the, you know, the territory because WCW, because of the Monday Night Wars, will be remembered forever. You know, my favorite matches ever, first one was Savage, really all of them. But the first one with Randy Savage, and what's really interesting, you know, like a lot of the guys back then would bust my chops because I'd lay the whole match out in my head before I ever went out right. there. And I it really improved, you know, when you're constantly – one of the reasons why Mick Foley could still do what he can do is because he's constantly doing, you know, his, his routine on the road. Then he'll come off, then he'll go back on the road, so which means he's exercising his brain. Because we all know Mick's been hitting the head a lot and taking lot. some bad concussions. And he's going to have to, the whole time, stay being Mick Foley, the smart guy who really you know, works his brain. For me, I could, I could lay out a whole match. And I wanted to be have the improvisation, but where I wanted to do it. And I wanted to make sure people understood what I was saying when I was talking about the match. And everybody busted my chops about it big time. Except for Randy. Because Randy did the same thing. And no one had the, the balls to bust Randy's chops. You know, I just I was just watching something. I, I just got a, a, a match sent to me of Fit Finley back in his, like, when he was just a just a stud you know he was as good as as good as you can get fit was his fit was a legit tough son of a bitch like legit yep. fight is a drop of the hat didn't want to but if the shit at the fan fit's gonna knock your ass out and they sent me a video of him i can't remember who he was wrestling uh but it was a great match uh and fit looked amazing at it and then it went right to people talking about the warrior and um you know, all different opinions about it started with Jake. Because Jake and the Warrior had a lot of heat back during the day. And I knew Jake wasn't going to talk to him, he just going to keep to himself at the Hall of Fame. And it bummed him out that they were both kind of on the same Hall of Fame. But Warrior came up to him and talked to him and apologized, and then Jake apologized, and it was the best thing that ever happened to Jake because he got to really leave all that that heat because, you know, none of the boys want to stay pissed off at each other, you know, especially, but they do, guys will carry grudges, you know, but to me, they're not the elite. 
the ones that carry the grudges. And, and Warrior doing what he did, um, it really, you know, I felt really bad what happened to him, you know, you know, right after that when he passed the way he did. Um, but uh, at least he made peace with a lot of people. So that, that was pretty cool. I don't remember why I got on that <laughs> subject, but uh, um, um, it was something to do with this this whole thing where people were talking about Warrior. Go ahead, go to something else. <laughs> Can't remember why I went there. <laughs> we got a DDPY app question. Uh, are there any more workouts from the moon that are going to be added? <laughs> uh, probably in the next six months, yeah. There's, I've got some other ideas. Yeah, I, my whole thing with doing that was because um, we had a green screen, and I wanted to show people that you, you could do it anywhere, including the moon. <laughs> Funny, I I am psyched yeah. about D, I am psyched about the D, the DDP Jack stuff that I'm doing, um, getting people to uh, try these bands. I mean, it's, it's changed my body at a different level. It's made my body stronger. I'm going to be really push your nose uh, i just got the, the the final prototypes done so probably the next two weeks i'm going to really get the word out about that and somebody said hey man you should make another documentary uh are you allowed to talk about relentless coming out yeah Relent we have another documentary <laughs> and it's great um, really really inspirational it's, yeah it's called relentless and it'll be out we just, we, because it has to do with me blowing my back out and that journey from blowing my back out to where we are today, we were done with Relentless. And then I did the AEW, you know, match and jumping off the top rope and doing, like, I knew that had to be in it, you know, so, because it all talks about, you know, the body and being beat up and, you know, here I am in the beginning getting told I'm not going to ever wrestle again. And that's in 99. So 21 years later for me to be flying around, you know, at 63, like that proved the reason why I did that mainly because Cody wanted me to do it. But for me personally, I did it. It was a risk and reward thing, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, the risk was huge, especially when you talk about me going off the top rope to the guys on the floor. Um, the, um, the chance of me tearing my ACL, tearing my shoulder, uh, breaking my neck, they were all pretty high. You know, it's sick, you know, almost 64 years old. I'm like two months from 64 in that, in that spot. And it could have happened. It didn't. But it could have, but it proved that look what I could still do. I could still go out and wrestle a couple times a month if I wanted to at a pretty high level. But every time I would leave some of my body out there and it's not worth it to me. Not worth it. A diamond cutter, I'm good with. But after that, mm, too much other stuff. Nah, that's okay. <laughs> Somebody just asked uh, how you like being compared to David Schultz. I've never heard that. I guess I can see it. Back when I had the hair and everything, uh, yeah. <laughs> David Schultz would have been, like, because that's right when WWWF was starting to come up, in, you know, right at the end of 70s and early 80s. And when he slapped Stossel, I mean, he slapped the taste right out of his mouth. And he knew that was going to happen. It wasn't like it wasn't planned. He knew, but... He could always go to the court, which is what he did, because he used because he didn't think it was going to come like that. He thought it was going to slap him. He slapped the taste out of his mouth, and that changed his life forever. You know, and uh, it's it's a shame because he would have been an amazing, believable heel, like amazing. He already was, but it, it's gone on any level. You could take David Schultz at any time in wrestling and pop them in, whether it's the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000, today, he just beat the piss out of people, you know, because he, he he talked, you listen, you know, because you believe, like, ooh, I, he's a bad son of a bitch. 
Well, you talk, I listen, but let's let's do two or three more good questions and then get you on with your day. And I see a good one. Dallas, how's life as a granddad? I love it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I get, I get to play with you know my little granddaughter all the time, and when she starts, if she starts crying, like last, she's got her teeth coming in now. Boy, I never like tears are rolling. I never even seen that, and I just went, Brittany, <laughs> boop. <laughs> you know that's what's great about grandkids—you just give them back. But also, my girl Paige is here too, and uh, so she helps a lot. Uh, so you know she's got. Brittany and me and Paige. So, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's living pretty cool. Somebody asked, who do you think should be in the hall of fame of WWE? That's not. Mm, Eric Bischoff. He was in WWE, you know? So, uh, it, Eric Bischoff, needs to go in the hall of fame. Hmm. Someone said, where should one go to find local DDPY instructors? There is actually uh, we're, we're we're redoing the site uh, on the uh, uh, on the um, certification section, and uh, we're gonna we're, it's something we're working on right now. <laughs> well, everybody, let's get one good quick question and go out on a high note here. Ron, what was your feeling at the time you were honored? to become inducted to the WWE uh, Hall of Fame. We can ask that, and then let's ask about Goldberg after that. So first, what, what, what did it feel like to get an honor, hey, you're going to the Hall of Fame? It was huge. You know, uh, Dusty used to always say, you know, D, the only thing that's real in our business is that first world title and the Hall of Fame ring. And uh, he's right, man. Uh, he um, he would have been the guy that inducted. The only thing I missed was him inducting me. But Eric Bischoff did such a great job. And I know Eric, like, better than anybody. I did not tell you the truth because he, 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 he's a very smart guy. So a lot of times when he's going to do something live, he doesn't put the work in. He already has put the work in. But he has he doesn't write anything up. He just he goes out there and he and he feels the crowd. And I was that's going to be kind of hard with my stuff, you know. If you don't put the work in, and he did, he put the work in on that introduction. And I was listening to that while I'm talking to my four girls that I'm about to walk out with, and one of them who was only at the time 16 was really nervous. And I was like, great, it's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You know? But I'm listening to Eric, too, and I'm breathing in and out for 20 because I want to, you know, because I wanted, this was the one thing I wanted to do for myself that I didn't, I wanted this to be the best thing I ever did. And before I walked out there, well, from that morning that I woke up till the moment I walked out there, the only voice in my head was this is going to be my greatest moment in this business. I'm going to make people laugh. I'm going to make them cry. I'm going to inspire them. And that's all I said to myself. No other trade of thought. And I went out there and I thought I did the best job I've ever done at speaking to a crowd, especially when you consider it's 20,000 people and millions and millions of people yeah. watching at home. Uh, it was super powerful. And what was really cool is um, um, Beth Phoenix came up to me right after her speech. And she mm -hmm. said to me, I just got to thank you, D. She said, I listened to your speech. And I was literally before that getting in my own head and was second guessing myself. But after listening to your speech, I went out there and I had such a blast. I was living it. And I just want to thank, I was like, nothing could have made me happier. Because first of all, Beth Phoenix is one of, you know, they're, they are the first family of Hall of Fame wrestlers. You know, between her and, and Adam. And I'm so happy that he's back. When 
when I uh, when I did my thing with AEW, you know, of course, it went through the wrestling world like that, you know. And I saw Edge come back, you know, for that rumble. And I saw how, man, he just left it all out there. And I text him, man, so proud of you, bro. Like, you killed it. And he wrote me back. Who do you think was my inspiration? He said, if you could do it in 63, dude, I could do it. And uh, my body feels great. And he's someone I begged. I begged Edge to do DDPY when we were wrestling together. And he just didn't think he needed it. After he broke his neck, he started. And he wrote me one of the, the greatest testimonies. You know, and I said to him, uh, now, that was friggin' 10 years ago or whatever it was. And I said, make sure you keep doing your DDPY, bro. He goes, wouldn't leave home without it. You know, because guys <laughs> like that are, that are older and they've already had the results, they know, they get it. You know, we go, what do I care if you do my stuff or not? I care because it's going to help you. And it's going to make you, like, be able to perform at a different level. Um, which leads us to Goldberg. Another one of my favorite matches, you know, and that that Goldie could have, you know, had the incredible run that he has had, incredible run, and that if you look back, he hadn't even wrestled in a year and a half when we faced off in at the MGM Grand and and at Halloween Havoc, and green is grass, and that that would be his best match ever out of all of them. I mean, you can't say anything about my work except for it's really fucking good. You know, because I could make... And Goldberg, you know, we, we, me and him, we didn't argue, but it took me three weeks to get him to understand that he had to miss the spear one time. And he, he was like, no, I'm not missing the spear. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, you are. <laughs> and, and it'll make sense at some point. And once he watched it back, and then what the second spear when he taught me meant, you know, it was it was a, that 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 I that day. If you asked Bill Goldberg what match he would have wanted to lose to, it probably would have been that because the Diamond Cutter was so over. That right. people wanted to see that, and he could have won it back the next night, you know, because he's Bill Goldberg. But as opposed to getting hit with a prod, and Kevin Nash wasn't doing that, the bus is chops. He wants to show this guy's indestructible. We've got to use a cattle prod, and hit him in the head with a belt, and Scott B, and and you know, we, Kevin was just trying to throw as many things at Bill as as he could take. So that you could show this is a giant, you know, and that and Kevin Nash is six ten and as legit a badass as there's ever been in our business. So, you know, uh, the cattle prod I, again. I think he would have taken the diamond cutter. <laughs> All right, bro, I gotta go. I'm gonna go get my work in for the day. Hello, you've said it all. Thank you, Dallas. We love you. Thank you for your time. Talk soon, man. It's been your pleasure. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, man.